Welcome to MJ Gaming Spotlight. Uh, this is MJ Hobby Corner here hosting this little presentation. And uh, I want to uh, talk about another game today. Before I do that, I want to welcome new subscribers. Thank you for coming on board. Um, and for those of you that are new, if you're not really familiar with this little uh, series that I do called MJ Gaming Spotlight, it's basically I take a rule set from my game library. I've been collecting games for many years, and I simply talk about it. It's a very, uh, I try to keep it a very informal video where it's just basically uh, giving my two cents of the game and uh, and the rules and presenting the rule book and any expansions, etc., etc., and uh, basically just a way to geek out with you guys a little bit. I love talking about games. So, uh, and I do review the rules, uh, but again, it's not very in-depth, okay? It's very informal, just us talking about games. Um, I am not sponsored by any of the people that I show. I'm not sponsored by any websites that may pop up during the videos. Of it. Um, I do uh, conduct research on the game. I've been doing that more recently, so despite the fact that it's a very relaxed talk, I do provide research. If there are any uh, miniature companies that are shown in the book, I search for them, see if they're still around, uh, you know, anything like that. Um, if, the book, if the game has any battle reports on YouTube that may be useful, maybe to someone interested in the game, I will show that in the video, etc. But again, I'm not sponsored by any of the people. I don't own any of the material that uh, is shown in the video. This is all the author's property, the company's property. But once we purchase that game, it is it is our game. And so uh, it's a great way to kind of talk about these things, right? So uh, without any further ado, let's dive into today's spotlight. And today's spotlight is going to be put on the game when the Navy walked. Let's go check it out. All right, so um, when the Navy walked is an alternate history game. Okay, I bought purchased this from War Game Vault, and uh, it's a very interesting alternate history game. Um, it has a lot of influence from H.G. Wells. So uh, that was pretty interesting, and that uh, you can see that in the little YouTube uh, video that uh, I will try to post a link at the end of the, the in the description so you guys can see it. It was a very interesting uh, interview with the author. So here is a picture of the Martian uh, tri -walk, uh, tripod walkers. So uh, this assumes this game assumes that what happened with uh, War of the War of the Worlds is actually real you know it actually impacted history uh, and that's something that a lot of alternate history games do in this kind of era right on this kind of history fictitious history so it's very interesting and of course that led to many new technologies and then stuff so the book provides you with a little timeline and it takes place uh the periods are early 1872 to about 1919 that is from the victorian period roughly to the edwardian period in england okay and a uh, one very important distinction a lot of people call games that have some kind of steam technology in it immediately call it steampunk uh, that's not really the, the the case like this kind of game is what i call true steampunk a uh, true steampunk really has a lot of uh, alternate history in it. It is history. It's just twisted and turned and, and fictitious. Uh, and it can have some like super weapons and all that kind of stuff. But a lot of people confuse that with Steam Fantasy, which Steam Fantasy would be something like War Machine and Hordes, where it's a whole completely different world. Yes, Steam technology is the main kind of thing, but there's a lot of magic, there's all this stuff. So basically fantasy elements, okay? So Steampunk and Steam Fantasy are not the same thing. All right, so going back to the book. So the book also describes what is inside the earth so like middle of the earth kind of thing and that's really cool because i have a lot of cavern terrain that i just made and so this might be a very cool way of using my cavern terrain 
in another way, okay? Now, these rules are for a mass battle, but you can also play them in um, skirmish, all right? And I'm going to jump around the book a little bit, okay? Uh, this is a really nice picture. Also, this picture uh, brings to mind the fact that I can do a lot of new builds. So, for you guys that like my builds, I can... Um, do some steam walkers and really get into the whole steampunk thing that I've been wanting to get into, okay? Um, so, cool pictures in the book. Notice the artwork of the book. It's very black. It's all black and white. It has all these decorative, like, um, margins and everything. Very typical of this kind of game, this kind of history. The whole Edwardian history is all about artwork and stuff like that. So, uh so we get into building your army, and this part of the book um, shows you how to build your army, your units, your leaders, your generals, very important ground units. Uh, there are air units, of course. There's also artillery. You have um, steam tanks, steam walkers, and this really struck me, the Lincoln steam walkers. That was pretty interesting. Uh, just the whole thing of mixing in Lincoln you know, with, with, uh, it's something that happens in steampunk a lot, and it's, it's very cool. So, these are examples of units with some of their stats. So, uh, it tells you what to do with your command points. Uh, that's pretty cool. So, this core mechanic uses command points. Um, you get command points at the beginning of every turn. So, this is a resource management technique. Uh, not technique, but, uh, rule basically it, it the game has resource management in it you manage your command points and this allows you to activate your units and all that kind of stuff now uh one thing that this game is really big on and i found very interesting is unit formations you don't see that in a lot of games but uh these kinds of games uh this rule sets a little bit more in depth okay you have unit formations, and these formations uh, can change. You can change them during the game, and there are rules for that. And uh, they basically affect how those units play. You know, so that's a very interesting aspect of the game. There's another game that I own that is uh, more fantasy. It is medieval fantasy. And it also goes through unit formations and changes in unit formations. So I always found this uh, type of thing interesting. And i really interested to see how it affects this game. So playing the game. Now, this game has a lot of phases. Uh, there's about seven phases in the game. Sometimes that kind of intimidates me a little bit. Um, games that have a lot of phases, I generally... I don't know, at first sight, it kind of intimidates me. I'm thinking, mm, I don't know if, if it's going to be a very sort of congested turn, right? But we have to play the game, check it out in order to really know how these phases work, okay? So, uh, and that's something I plan to do, okay? And you sometimes you get games where the phases may look like there's a lot of phases, but they go by very quickly. I usually jot down the phases in a little index card, to help me remember. Okay, so um, this part of the uh, rule book explains the phases. And uh, there's a melee phase. There are, in within the melee phase, you could get flank, flank attacks. So uh, there is a sort of um, different, uh, you have like front arc, rear arc, uh, flanks, and things like that. Um, you have like cavalry formation. So this part of the book explains all that to you. Um, so that's cool. Um, the shooting phase, that is another part of the phase, uh, aside from the melee phase. So they separate shooting and melee. And uh, it basically just tells you, you know, what's going on in the shooting phase, how you shoot, how units are affected, and all that. Notice that everything is black and white. It's, it's a very simple kind of format that way and that that kind of gives you the the whole essence of the of the period i think these are example of shooting formations and the book goes into some of that good pictures i like the pictures uh simple black and white but i like it it, it does kind of show you what's going on and and that's always very important i still haven't read 
in a lot of depth about these phases, okay? So I have to go back to this book before I start playing uh, to really kind of get a handle on it. And again, um, you have definition of game units, which is very important. Just tells you all the different kinds of units that there are. Artillery, you know, uh, troops, riflemen, whatever it is. Okay, you also have air units in this game. You do have biplanes. And that's cool, because I've always loved biplanes. And then you have steam tanks, and that's huge. I'm, I love steam tanks and steam mechs. So there are rules for all that. And it describes the units quite nicely. So the book definitely gets points for that. I, I do like the artwork too. I, I do like that basic kind of black and white outline out, out, um, artwork. So again, this goes back to formations. And here uh, in, in the book, it, it tells you how to change your formations. It gives you rules for that. Um, formation descriptions. What are the different formations? So for example, example... Cavalry will have, uh, you know, triangular formations, right? Uh, and how they work in cavalry. How do they affect cavalry? What kind of benefits it gives you? It may be strategically important, okay? Um, edges and flaws. Now, this is a very interesting part of the rule book because your commanders, your units, don't only have upgrades, the edges. They also have flaws. And I like that. Okay, uh, uh, you know, when we're playing fantasy games or whatever, obviously our heroes are like the pick of the litter. You know, they're the, the most powerful, whatever. But here you get flaws as well. I like that. That's pretty cool. So you, it kind of makes you think a little bit. Okay, well, this leader has this benefit, but he also has this flaw, you know. So very cool. Effects of cover and casualties. Again, um uh, it's a cool thing. This talks a little bit about that. What happens with casualties? How do you take damage? All that stuff. Very important. That's all part of the core mechanic. All right. And I haven't spoken very much about the core mechanic yet. Um, okay. But it is uh, opposing roles. Okay. Let's go back a little bit. Uh, I'm going to go back again uh, because this is important. This is part of the core mechanic of the game. And we're going to go back to the uh, phases. Now, uh, each phase is played uh, by players in um, order of the unit's uh, command value. Okay, so you have a command value from highest to lowest that determines how units are going to go. And this will mean that you will get to go and then your opponent might get to go right after you and then you go back or your opponent might go again. It's kind of the way Rain and Hell works. That's the only thing I can think about off the top of my head. Uh, the way Rain and Hell works with its initiative phases. That's very interesting. Uh, so I needed to mention that because that is part of the core mechanic. All right, so going back now, uh, we, you saw this slide before, resolving damage, you know, the book uh, uh, the rules go into how you get damage and how your units get hit and are taken out and all that stuff so obviously that's important okay there is something called sabotage that is very important as well okay and i'm not going to go too much into that but all right so uh the book shows you some pictures of models these were models i i don't know if these exist actually these were supposed to be I don't know if they exist, uh, but this is an interesting tank, and it's very much based on a World War I German tank, um, and uh, just an interesting model. It gives a lot of ideas for building some steam tanks for this game, you know, so very cool. Um, but again, I didn't find any information on this kind of stuff, so uh, I don't know. Uh, this it seems to be a dead game, by the way, uh, unfortunately. So uh, there is a turn sequence sheet, and I like when rule books do this. They go kind of go back and give you a nice summary. This is what happens in the turn, in the phases, especially when it has a lot of phases. So that's a good thing. Uh, nice uh, diagrams along with a lot of the tables and things that go with the game. Okay, so uh, yeah, I really like that aspect of the rules. Uh, how difficult are they? Well, it's going to take me a little while to get my head around them, I think. For me, personally. And this varies, you know, depending on who's doing the reading. 
But for me, it's it's going to take me a little while to kind of wrap my head around the different phases and how everything works. Now, the book has a scenarios. Uh, there are scenarios, and then there are the missions for those scenarios. So the missions, uh, there could be a meeting engagement, a surprise attack, and, you know, an ambush or something like that. So interesting mission descriptions, which give your scenarios more flavor. I, I do like that, and um, that's something that seems to be... Uh, a part of games like this, you know, they give you nice, uh, detailed missions for your scenarios, and that's cool, you know, nothing wrong with that. Any traps that might be in the scenarios, they also put that in. Just an example of a scenario map, and of course, you would fill in the gaps, so, you know, add your own terrain and everything else, but basically, these are the main components. You have these buildings in the center, and uh, there's either a road or a river in the middle. It describes everything for you. And again, you have that nice margin of artwork on every page. And I just want to point that out because it's very typical of these kinds of, you know, steampunk alternate history games. So just an interesting touch. Uh, does seem like a nice book. I didn't purchase the actual book. This is all done by my digital copy of the book. Okay, so again, uh, the book gives you explanations, um, a definition of game units, and this page should have probably been a previous uh, slide, right? They're a little mixed up, but basically uh, it's telling you, okay, what do we consider this unit of riflemen? You know, is this a square formation? Is this, you know, whatever. It just goes into... Uh, unit formations and leaders are single units there are single units like tanks and steam mechs and things like that that are uh characterized by the game so it's very cool so again you have your internal hits table there's a table to give you damage and everything else uh you roll 2d6 this game works on d6s by the way okay so uh that's important to mention. We, we got to know what kind of dice it works on, right? Um, now, the internal hits here, this is talking about land ships. So, you know, in alternate history, you have these huge fortress tanks. They're usually called land ships. They can actually be in the shape of ships sometimes, you know. Now, this is a, a, an interesting section of the book. This gives you some ideas for miniatures in, uh, that you can use to play this game. I like that. I like when books do that. I did check out this website. It is a real website, apparently. Now, I have no affiliation with this uh, uh, miniature seller. I don't know how they how they are. You know, I, I just can't tell you anything. But they do have a very cool website. And um, you'll see that in a, in a slide that's coming. Okay. So, what did I find about the game? I did not find uh, the game's original website, which is why I'm assuming it's a dead game. There are no YouTube battle reports. There is, however, a YouTube video uh, that of a person that interviewed the author, and he talks about the game. And there are a couple of blogs that I found online. I'll have a uh, link to one of those blogs in the description. So, not very much, okay? Not very much. And going back now, this is the website, uh, the front page of the website when I checked it out for the miniatures, and uh, it's got some cool stuff. Uh, but again, I don't know anything about this manufacturer, okay? I can't tell you anything about it. But it, a lot of cool stuff, so you want to check it out, check it out. Um, it's You'll see uh, a link to this in the description as well, okay? So uh, again, it's nice when rule books do this because... Alternate history, sometimes you wonder, hmm, like, should I use troops of that period? Uh, do I use historical minis and just convert them or whatever, you know? Uh, so it's nice that they give you an idea of what kinds of minis and things to use. All right, now, I'm going to use a combination of things for this game. All right, uh, this is another website that I found during a search and this, I searched for Edwardian and Victorian, Victorian period. And um, I got this uh, miniature website. It sells 172 scale miniatures. And I googled uh, 172 scale miniatures of the Edwardian period. 
and this is what I got, okay? So again, I know nothing about this seller or what they're about, but it seemed pretty cool. And they have some really cool 172 scale miniatures. That's if you want to use that kind of scale in this game, that's what I'm going to be using uh, for this game. Okay, so uh, just a diagram of shooting to have in the background. Italeri models, this is an example of some of the minis that I would use. Even if they're not exactly of the area, This is these are Napo Napoleonics, okay? This one are, is very uh, much that kind of period, okay? So this is our miniatures by Hat, and they are 172 scale. I would definitely use those, and I like Hat as a company. Um, Anglo-Egyptian Army, this is another example that I found online. This would be a cool kind of uh, miniature in 172 scale with that kind of flavor theme of the period, okay? So these are just examples that I gave to give ideas to people. This game does have other expansions, and they're very, very inexpensive. We're talking like four bucks. And so I do plan on getting some of the expansions. I have one. Okay, and these are all like campaign uh, play and stuff like that. And to conclude, you know, it's a very interesting web uh, rule set. I would definitely give it a try. Uh, this is alternate history and steampunk has always been an interest of mine. You have land ships, you have steam mechs, you have all kinds of interesting things that you can do with these games. Now, as far as this rule set, I will have to study it a bit. Wrap my head around a bit, it a bit, okay? It is a rule set that goes in-depth into the mechanics of things. So, you know, we'll see. We'll see if it's cumbersome or easy to play. We'll see. And, yes, I do not own any of the photos that I've presented. Uh, this is a list of all the credits that the book gives, uh, okay? I do own the game, and it will be my game. But as far as any of the material that I show, this is it's, it's their stuff. However, um, you know, this is just to uh, give you an idea of an interesting game. This could be a very interesting rule set for that period. We don't have a lot of steampunk games available out there. Okay, I own uh, three steampunk rules, and this is one of them. Okay? Yeah. Okay, so that was a very basic overview of of the rule book of the game okay um, again these spotlights don't go into a lot of detail um, I will be doing future videos on this game on the rules as soon as I wrap my head around some of the rules uh, I will go into more in depth into the rules later um, I will have some builds probably some steam mechs some steam tanks things like that so if you're interested in that some scratch builds I will talk about that. We're going to talk about 172 scale miniatures, which is what I want to use for this game. This is one of the games, one of the reasons that I'm collecting 172 scale now. Um, so if you are interested, that will come in the future, okay? I will introduce this game to my team, to my game team, and see if this is something that they're interested in. Uh, if not, I'll just do some videos on the rules and do some some example plays and, and things like that. I I think you can probably play this game solo. You can you can do that with a lot of games actually. Even games that don't have actual solo rules, you can actually alter the rules a little bit. And maybe play solo. So if that's the case, then that's what I'll do. Okay. So I will have more examples in the future if you're interested. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you liked this video as much as I enjoyed doing it. Take care, guys, and I'll see you in the next video. Don't miss the Martin and Julie talk. That will probably be uploaded sometime this evening or tomorrow Monday. Have a good day, guys. We'll talk very soon.